coming at you live from California. The Lucas Mather Studios. We're talking about the socialist threat today. Let's see if I can tag a buddy of mine. Courtesy of Mr. Zuckerberg. We have Kent Duncan joining us, a veteran, a doctor of sorts, a, someone who's concerned about socialism, as I am, someone who also lives in communist California, as I do. And so we're waiting for, for Kent to join us. Uh, let me make sure I have what we're talking about. We're talking about the socialist threat by S. Roan, and that's uh, going to be linked in the comments. It's also linked in the announcement, which was less than a day ago. We've talked about all four, all three of the previous essays, and this is the last one, and you can find those links <clears throat> by checking the link for this one. So here it is. The Socialist Threat by S. Roan. That's the topic of conversation. And uh, we're waiting for Kent. So hopefully Kent will be with us shortly. I mean, I could talk about this myself, but I, I want to wait for Kent. All right, we're waiting. We're waiting for Kent. I've got my notes, so you can just look at my mug shot for a second, <laughs> for a while. Hopefully that my microphone is working. I always feel like my microphone is a little bit too low. I think this trying to join. I'm Kent. I don't see a request to join from you, buddy. And I have I have sent a request for you to watch, or well, I've sent a request for you to watch, but not to join. Let's see. Oh, well. let me see. Okay, hold on, Kent. <laughs> All I know is what I can do on my side. I, I don't know what you can do on your side. How many of you guys read it? <laughs> you don't have to read it, but I mean, you could if you want. You'll you'll get more out of it if you read it. Can't I wish I could show you what I? Uh... Let's see here. Kent, when I, when I, 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 I can't, there's no button for me to say bring you on, for, for me to bring you on camera. I don't know why, because it doesn't show you as watching it. Which kind of whiskey am I drinking? I'm drinking Writer's Tears. It's Irish. Something's blocking me from keep taking you on camera, Kent. Let me 
see here. Oh, jeez. The rest is just what mask I want to wear. Give me a break. Well, Kent, is there anything that allows you to request to join the video? No, Kent, the only option that I had was what mask I want to wear. <laughs> Which is nothing. Usually, uh, I'm able to just... Okay, Kent, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and call you. I'm going to call you. Okay, I'm gonna sh Kent, I'm going to send you a couple of texts so that you can see what I'm looking at. And I'll call you. Hey, buddy. And I'll call you. Yeah, I hear you now. Um, Kent, I, I've just texted you a picture of what I've seen, and I, there's no button for me to hey, push. Buddy. Can you hear me? There's no button for... Did you get those texts that I sent? Okay, so for some reason when you comment, I cannot add you to the... I can add to other people, but I can't add you. Um, and so usually Curtis Curtis comes on, his face, his name comes on, and I can it says bring him on camera, and I can click that. Um, so... Do you have Facebook on your phone? Okay. We have to be off the phone for you to do it, though. We have to be off off the phone. So try that. Okay? Okay. Sounds good. All right. We're, we're trying something else. We're trying. He was trying it with his computer. So we'll try it with the phone. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, Kent, I see that you're watching. Okay, good. So hopefully we'll have Kent in 2.5 nanoseconds. Hey. Hey, what's up? Good to see you, man. All right, Looks good like to see it's you an too. Issue. Yeah. Looks like yeah. it's an issue with the technology. That's all right. We got it taken care oh, of. Oh, what was that? I believe oh, that looks uh, that looks intellectual. Whatever that was. <laughs> all right, Lucas J. Mather. Can that you hear like me? Some books. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. All right. I'm gonna have to that, tweak that this. Looked, uh, that looked very intellectual. What you had on your desk there. Uh, it was just the books American Heritage College Dictionary and the Dictionary of Cultural Literacy. Not much. Okay. All right. Uh, no, so think dictionaries we're good. are very good. So uh, All right. this, the socialist threat, I've already kind of introduced it. And take it away, man. We're doing the socialist threat by S. Rohn. All right. Uh, for those who have not um, been around for the last three talks or two or three talks over the first three articles, 
Uh, this is uh, an article by an anonymous, or I should say pseudonymous, uh, author S. Roan. Uh, the fourth in the series, The Socialist Threat, the first being um, Mostly Peaceful, followed by Understanding Consolidation, followed by The Citizens Amendment. And you and uh, Curtis wrapped that up last week, did a really good job. Thank you. Um, there, um, basically, it looks like this author's approach to the current political scene is that uh, we're we are seeing a uh, growing trend of socialism, lack of lack of the basic uh, structure of constitutional democracy that was laid down in the Constitution. On uh, the first essay, if we could just go back, I, I think I would like to start off by uh, just reading the beginning of the essay, The Socialist Threat. And then, yeah, to read, um, read liberally from it or conservatively, you know. Exactly. You, you know, either or one. Independently. <laughs> read republicanly. Demo democratically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but as we go through this, there are going to be certain uh, certain uh, times when we need to kind of dip back into the previous essays to understand the actual uh, context of what is being said. Uh, so we have about a five page essay where uh, the, uh, the author is claiming that the way things are now, not just because of the election and what happened last year, but because of the structure of our, of our democracy, the structure, the, how things are being worked out, uh, the structure of our electoral process, the structure of uh, the uh, democratic process is being uh, transformed in many ways into more of a socialist structure. Um, and that there's a, and that the Democratic Party, and not just, uh, and that's bad, right? And that is not a good thing. That's bad. And the he, Democratic he mentions Party, the, yeah. the, the first the first page. He mentions a key character in this, a Democrat. Well, a guy that's running as a Democrat. True. Ber Bernie Sanders. And he's saying. Bernie is the guy to watch here because he believes Bernie is was the one that is most reflective of what Democrats actually think. But even though he didn't win or he didn't yeah, he didn't win the nomination, right? True. Because elites intervened to stop it because he wouldn't win otherwise. He wouldn't win. Well, of course Hillary didn't win either. And then he says, who exactly is Bernie Sanders? Yes, and, exactly. Oh, and then going by, you know, your obviously love of definitions, because you have a dictionary right on the desk. I'm a huge fan of, of dictionaries, hard copy dictionaries. Uh, he defines some terms. So let's maybe we should go through those terms. Okay. So that necessitates talking about what exactly socialism is, what exactly is democratic socialism or social yeah. democracy. Uh, yeah. Are these, uh, these things are just being thrown around randomly without it being defined. Uh, let me back mm -hmm. up before we get to the definition. Not, part, by, let me not back by him up. though, not by him. Oh no. Yeah, he wants to define the terms. Anybody that wants terms. to define terms, I, I already like them. Anybody that says, let's define some terms, I already like them. That's someone who, that, that's a very philosophical thing, is definition of terms. Okay, so the first one, what is socialism? You want to take that one? I'll take the next one. Well, uh, before Marianne that, I Webster. wanted to follow oh, okay. up on one thing. Sure. Let's, let's open this article with uh, the actual opening. The author claims that basically... Uh, there are two different directions that the country can take now. We can mo move more into a what he calls the the form of comfort zone, 
a comfort zone, which is assuming the Democratic Party will will cue moderates and adhere to the Constitution. Just the assumption that uh, the party will continue to be a moderate party. Uh, the other possibility is that we on the right or independents and true liberals can take these claims that uh, the Democrat Party on the left is making and take them seriously. And, hence, yeah. and, and thus plan for the worst, which the author is trying to say is leading down a road towards socialism. So if you, if, you, uh, if you believe the first of these, then you, you put yourself in the shoes of your typical moderate uh, Democrat who was voted that way their whole life and, and thinks that the party will continue to move that in that direction and will stay more moderate and middle of the road centrist. Uh, but he's arguing that that's not the case. If you believe that, then I've got some swamp land to sell you in Louisiana. <laughs> so he asked the question, right. what is the worst possible scenario? And then he goes into defining terms and, and, and the role that Bernie Sanders played in 2016 and 2020 by arguing mm -hmm. that he did have these radical agendas, uh, agenda, and he basically came out and stated that his whole purpose of, is revolution. A la the transfer, radical transformation of uh, Barack Obama in 2008, 2009. So since Bernie claims to want a revolution, and he claims to be a social democrat or democratic socialist, uh, Roan goes in, dives into defining those terms, and here we go with the first one being socialism itself. So socialism, according to Merriam-Webster, is either a various, various economic and one of their various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production, typically what we associate with communism, socialism. Or a, it can be a group living with no private property, sort of like a communal farm, uh, hence the word communism, or a system where the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. Lastly, the definition states that it is a, a stage of society in Marxist theory between capitalism and communism, distingu distinguished by un unequal distribution of goods and pay according to the work done, or pay according to merit. So those are the definitions of socialism that so, we so, are left with. Yeah, so, so good old Byrne would say that he's a democratic socialist. Right, so he's not a that? socialist. What about that? Well, no, he is a socialist. <clears throat> if you're a democratic socialist, you're still a socialist. Well, I think Roan tries to imply that he's, uh, you know, engaging in a shell game here by, you know, moving, moving around, being vague with his terms and not, he doesn't want to be associated. And that's what typically, typical DSA people would say. You know, we're not really socialists, we're democratic socialists. They, so they try to give the impression that we're sort of one of these, like one of these uh, European, uh, Icelandic or Scandinavian countries that are sort of a blend, uh, a blend between socialism and, and capitalism. Okay. Uh, but uh, Rome goes on to, to state that what Sanders claims democratic socialism doesn't even really exist in the dictionary, if, or if it does, it's, it's very sparse, and that on the other hand, <clears throat> social democracy is defined by Miriam as uh, the transition to socialism by de democratic means. And that's what Oxford defines that as, as well. A label for any person or group who advocates the pursuit of socialism by democratic means. Ironically, the, uh, the Nazi takeover of Germany prior to World War II was a democratic socialist agenda. The Nazi party was a socialist party and Hitler was elected. Maybe yes. that's not ironic, <laughs> but we can't, we're not going to get into fascism yet because that's a different topic or is it? Maybe it's not. Well, we may not anyway, need okay. to because we have so much at hand with. So, how does he define democratic socialism? The Oxford, the, the concise Oxford Dictionary of Politics and International Relations. Well, Oxford defines it 
as uh, democratic socialism, if there is a definition, mm -hmm. this would be it. Mm -hmm. A label for any person or group who advocates the pursuit of socialism by democratic means. So yeah. the democratic part of it is does not meant to elicit true definitions of democracy and Western democracy and, and uh, the main, maintenance of American constitutional democracy. It's merely, the democracy part is merely a means to that socialist end. It's, it's just socialism. Right. Basically, it's a means Rome, to an end. The democracy Rome, is not an end in itself. It's socialism is the end in itself. Socialism is democracy the is the end. means to it. Yes. Right. Oh, that's a key part of it. That's a key part of it. Now, let me well, let me talk about really quick about what the problem is here with America. The problem is is that this is incompatible with the Constitution, specifically the Fifth Amendment, right? The text of the Fifth Amendment. I would say it's incompatible with the entire Constitution, probably. But um, the, there's certain texts that are the most clear, I guess, the Due Process Clause and the Takings Clause. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, not to mention the Second Amendment, the, the, the First Amendment, which he mentions the problems with the religion, Late, a little, right there in page two, at least my page two. The problem with what? How do? How would you say the problem is uh, with socialism in terms of the taking clause? That's in the Fifth Amendment. No person Nor shall, shall be, private property be right. Sorry, good. Yeah, I see that there. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that that clause, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Yeah. That is a problem because if, if we're talking just about socialism and and democratic socialism really just boils down to socialism, then it, it really does become a, a theory and a practice, not just a theory, a practice of controlling production, controlling goods and services, um yeah you know the take the taking and in clause case, in the... well i was going to say in case anybody is really wondering whether bernie believes that the government should control distribution of services um you look at those quotes that he mentions on page three from Bernie, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. Where he talks about Bernie's concern about, um, well, actually, it's on page four, I believe. Yeah, there's there's some cru 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 crucial cru quotes, but we're going to get to that. But yeah. Now, as I read the Fifth Amendment, no private property sh shall be taken for public use without just compensation. The just compensation would mean that there should not be any net loss of private property <clears throat> ever. Exactly. According to the framers, because if your private property is taken, then you have to be compensated for it in a just and fair way. And that would be other private property, right? It wouldn't be, mm -hmm. <laughs> it wouldn't be public property that you get. That doesn't. That's a contradiction. Right. I can't or get equal public value of, property. Or, right or equal value of fiat money, cash. Well, that's mm -hmm. private property. Yeah. Yeah, cash would be private property. It would be the, it would be private property because it's the uh, like your the balance you have in your account is private property. Mm -hmm. That would be the case, yes, in the just society, and, and the Fifth Amendment Amendment does allow that the government overtaking mm -hmm. land and be and, and farmers have to be compensated, especially along well, land. But there's, yeah, there's a specific thing he says though that 
that um, I don't know if you caught that. You probably did because I know you did a real careful precy of this. But he says that this was never intended to be a general thing. It was. It was the taking possibility was instead limited to individual cases. Right. Exactly. So I think what he's getting at there is that uh, if we're looking at um, the way the reason yeah. socialism runs in runs into a a roadblock here with the Fifth Amendment mm -hmm. is that the Fifth Amendment did foresee certain cases where property would be taken by the government for for public use or public land. <clears throat> In the, in the case of, uh, for example, using our, building our national parks or, you know, building a wall on the southern border. Um, but it, it never it never envisioned <laughs> yeah. just yeah. compensation, oh, just shit. compensation. Oh, but it never envisioned a, a scenario where all private property, a la socialism or democratic socialism or social keep democracy. keep saying a la. Are you a Muslim now? I mean, what's going on with that? I mean, are you praying in the middle? <laughs> I well, love my I guess French. That's, uh, we do need all the blessing we can get. Oh, okay. sorry. So, as you said, the founders never thought this, this extreme, you know, taking of all private property would even be an issue. They never right. looked to a day where right. this is this is all before socialism and communism. But the, it, it it came down to uh, the fact that they'd already broken away from the king. They thought that with the despotism that they had to deal with and, yeah, and now we're right the tyranny that they they didn't see this first foresee this kind of tyranny where yeah where people would want to yes give up their own rights to property wouldn't it have been great if if the founders knew about marx if they had already and 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 they could have written this specifically like like okay we know about <laughs> this guy carl over there the guy with the beard yeah not that, not you know, <laughs> in case there's any question, not that, not that, yes, not that guy. Well, I think let's let's move back to uh, back to page three, where we were just defining terms. We defined socialism. We defined democratic socialism. Basically, Roan is claiming that what Sanders claims to be a democratic socialist doesn't even exist. There are no democratic socialists. There is okay. simply socialism. Yeah, gotcha. There is simply socialism. And this is what he's claiming. He's, he's, he's playing a, a language game as the left does to, ob to obfuscate terms so that we are sort of assuaged into believing that it's not as evil as it possibly could be. It can't be anything like communism. It can't be anything like, you know what happened in the USSR, or 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 communist China, or, or Vietnam, or Cuba, or North Korea, or Laos, and it can't be anything akin to what's happening in Venezuela today, or Cuba. It's just democratic socialism. It's 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 socialism light. Um. So, part of. Sanders' language game is to not just obfuscate terms, but to also claim that, hey, this is also a model that's worked in other places. You know, that's if we look at the Scandinavian right. countries, we look at Denmark, Sweden, and so forth. Uh, this is this, yeah. those are social democracies or places where socialism has worked. Mm -hmm. But he gives Rome gives the examples of uh, the Swedish prime minister. Basically saying that you know we are not, we're not a social democracy. We may we may have uh, certain certain socialist practices, but we are basically a capitalist economy. We are a market economy. Ditto right. for Denmark. Right. Yeah, and this is where we learn that, <laughs> and this really hit me when I saw that under the Swedish prime minister thing hmm. where he, he referred to this really hit me. I, I, and I feel like I already knew this, but for some reason it just hit me even more powerfully. <laughs> when Bernie Sanders was visiting the Soviet union 
on his honeymoon. <laughs> and I, I just, it, it just hit me. I, I thought, how messed up is that, dude? You went to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics on your honeymoon. And he went there to praise the Soviet Union, he, to find things to praise. Well, they didn't have the strip in Cancun yet, so, and he couldn't go to Cabo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a little bit of wind here, but my pages are going. Uh, I don't know. That just hit me like, what kind of person goes to the Soviet Union? Let me let me just stop here and share a personal anecdote. Sure, sure. When I was in high school, which is when this was, when he went on his honeymoon, I was in I was in high school. And we ha I was taking Russian in high school. So I was learning Russian and part of of our experience in Russian in high school was to have foreign exchange students. We 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 sent some people there. I wasn't on the trip that went there, and and but I heard all about it when they got back. And then we had briefly a time where some S Soviet students came and stayed with Americans here. And this is toward the end of the Soviet Union. But but man, I I mean. I'm not even going to talk about the BO and the, the washing practices <laughs> that we, we obviously, that was the first thing you noticed was they don't wear deodorant and they, they smell like they just walked out of a sewer, basically. Hmm. I but, remember that. But um, you could just tell that these kids were just flabbergasted in America that the at the plenty that we had you could just go down the street to King Supers there was a King Supers right mm -hmm. down the street from our high school and the the King Supers is like Ralph's here and, and uh, it's the same it's Kroger basically it's the same company uh, and they they didn't have any comprehension of that this was what year? By the way, I mean, this would have been in the, um, this would have been in 1990. Oh. One year before the Soviet Union fell. Okay, so you not, went. Not an uh, accident, not an accident. Right. right. Not an accident. Okay. Not, not an accident. Well, my first and only trip to the Soviet Union was not, was after it fell. It might have been 91. Russia. It might have been 91. Okay. They came. But it was right toward the end, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. I remember the the headline in the Rocky Mountain News, because I grew up in Colorado. Mm -hmm. The headline in the Rocky Mountain News said, "Communism is dead." And I kept that paper. I still have it. And the reaction I had when I saw it was, "No, it's not." That's the first reaction I had. I couldn't believe it that they had that. I think it was 1990. I'll, um, <clears throat> you know, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Well, I went uh, to Russia on a mission trip in 1992. So it was wow. the year after. Yeltsin had been in power about in a year. And mm -hmm. there, the only progress that was made in the in that time period was that there was an opulent McDonald's in the middle of Red Square. So okay. that was about the only sign of westernization. There were still bread lines and uh, um, you know uh, Sanders had been there years before on his honeymoon. I think in the seventies was it? No, it was. Or was that the eighties? Um, it was nineteen eighty eight. 88 when he went? Okay. Yeah. That's what Roan says. Okay. So not much had changed from 88 to 92. 
communist bread lines had now become Russian bread lines. Uh, so sad. What you know, you know, Roan mentions bread lines. What what is the significance of what he mentions for bread lines? Because he mentions it. Are we getting ahead of ourselves? Uh, he mentions slightly, it in that second slightly. quote. Okay. I think it's on page four. Um, yep, that's where I'm at. He basically. Yeah, I'll skip ahead there. So the <laughs> he says basically that uh, oh there you go get the text on page four. So what Roan is basically saying about with the example of breadlines is that. The reality was that the reason that were, there were bread lines is because the uh, the efficiency of the socialist system just wasn't working. There wasn't much choice, and he, he basically says that that is choice is the choice is the characteristic mm -hmm. that defines a successful market economy. When you have choice, you have a market economy. When you when you take away a mar the market economy and you segue into socialism, you're you're limiting choice. And he basically says choice is a good thing. Where Sanders was saying that, hey, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't all this negative press that the that the uh, Soviet Union, Soviet Union, and the and other socialist states are getting about lack of choice and bread lies isn't isn't necessarily such a bad thing. At least that they have, at least they have bread, right? Right. At least they have the ability to stay in the line and get bread. What's why sh we shouldn't be complaining about that? Right. Uh, so he doesn't see that as such a negative thing. <laughs> he says, the stations were absolutely beautiful, including the works of art. The chandeliers were beautiful. It was a very effective system. And I was impressed by the youth programs. You can't continue to change, continue growth for the sake of growth in a world in which we're struggling with climate change and all kinds of things, all right? Oh, Lord. You don't necessarily need a choice of 23 underarm deodorants or 18 pairs of sneakers when children are hungry in this country. I don't think the media yep. appreciates the kind of stress that ordinary ordinary Americans are going through or working on. Ordinary Americans. So. Yeah. Well, we do have poor folks in our country, but how many of them are really hungry? Like, I, he used the word hungry. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting quote. He says, you don't need, as he pits the, the choice you have in deodorant and sneakers with availability of food for poor people as if they're at odds with each other. Right. So I thought that was interesting. That was, that was a, a telling sign of his intellectual molestation. <laughs> well, I think really, the only reason... Yeah, we have an overabundance of food in this country. We sh we throw so much food away in this country. We throw more food away in this country than we do sneakers and uh, deodorant. I guarantee you. Yes, every day at every supermarket and every restaurant. We pay farmers not to grow food. You know, we we have an abundance of food. You know, uh. Thomas Thomas Nagel, wow, Thomas Soul, quite mm -hmm. a big difference between Thomas Nagel and Thomas Soul, nothing to do with race mm -hmm. necessarily, but but uh, Thomas Soul has a wonderful thing about talking about kids that are hungry, and uh, and he he makes fun of this because he says that people look, <laughs> he said he says that. The people on welfare have an obesity problem, and so he says it's it's funny when you when you lump these statistics together, hmm. a whole bunch of quote unquote hungry people are obese. <laughs> he says one of the predictors of being hungry, quote unquote hungry, is obesity. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's Thomas Soul. We'll have to do that another time, but he was just a master at undermining this kind of bull crap and still is we this, still have him he just doesn't write praise the Lord. anymore yeah 
praise the Lord. Uh, but he, writes, you, he writes privately. Yes. And we'll need to buy his books. But uh, but I think what what you're hitting at there is that the uh, revolution, the Sanders prescription for healing all our national problems <laughs> is really uh, is <laughs> healing. Is, it's is, is disingenuous because it claim it doesn't claim to be what it really is. Sure. And number two, it doesn't take the problems that are part of that theory, that political theory, seriously. Wants to sideline mm -hmm. them. Whereas your average American knows the difference. At least people who are alert and awake. Not woke, but awake. Okay. People who pay attention to the details can read between the lines. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, he mentions Adam Smith, but it's not just Smith. But by the way, PJ O'Rourke had a great uh, book on Adam Smith, and it's on, I listened to it on audio. Great, great time if you want to listen to it. He's, he's, he's so effective at, at explaining that book. The reason that you have so many choices of bread, I mean, mm. you probably have more choices in bread than you do deodorant. That's that's the ironic thing about the breadline thing. You have um, the the bread aisle in my supermarket is much larger than the deodorant aisle. It's maybe not as large as the the sneaker hmm. aisle hmm. because we don't even sell sneakers at the grocery store. We have entire, you know, we have entire stores that sell just sneakers, but um, we, we, it's not like we have choice in sneakers and deodorant, but not bread. We have huge stores of food all the time. And you, you almost can't even mm -hmm. choose. I mean, I, I have a preference of my bread when I go. But oftentimes, I don't want to pay the price of the bread. So sometimes I'll go to the um, the discarded items aisle. There's a place in, in the grocery store that allows you to find, you know, the place where the, they're discounted items. Sure. You can almost always buy bread for a 99 cents or something like that. So you're and saying sometimes you, that's what I get. You're What's saying that? you like have that you like having that choice. Yeah. That well, option. the reason we do is because what gets the bread guy up in the morning isn't the the altruistic sense of I'm going to feed some families today. It's that he wants to feed his own family. And so he, he wants to, you know, the, the Dave's bread is what I buy. Famous Dave's bread. You know, he, he came up with that tasty organic bread. Allegedly it's organic. I'm not sure about that, but okay, whatever. It, it's decent mm. bread. It tastes good. Um, and he wanted to have a successful company and to feed his own family. That That's why he does it. He doesn't do it because he's worried about, you know, feeding the hungry. <laughs> he, right. he does it to, to, to provide for his own family. The same reason that sneaker companies do what they do to try to outpace the other companies and the same reason that deodorant companies do the same thing. In our system, we don't have, there a lot of students have government bias, but in the pure uh, design of our government, there's no bias toward the government in any of these things. What Sanders has is a bias toward the government. And this is what I've noticed with my students when I teach business ethics and public policy is the ones that like Bernie, they have a bias toward the government. And I just uncover that typically. And I say, well, why do you have a bias toward the government? First of all, you have to acknowledge that you have a bias toward the government. The second thing is, is you have to ask yourself, why do you have that bias? What is it that the government has done to prove to you 
that they are more efficient and more just in distributing these resources. And you have to be specific because the government is a trillionaire. The government is a trillionaire. It is the 1%. So you can't tell me that you are against the 1% and be biased toward the government at the same time. You can't tell me that you're against guns and have a bias toward the government at the same time. The Black Lives Matter and the defund the police ha run into this squarely mm -hmm. because the police are the government. They have the guns. So the part of the Second Amendment is to, to spread that risk out a bit. You know, if there's a risk with guns and violence, that spreads it out. And it, it takes away the bias toward the government with guns. And so that's what I, that's how I attack that problem. And usually when they see it through that lens, they, they never go back. You know, uh, when I point out that Nevada, for example, is owned by the government, 85% of Nevada is owned by the government. Trump might own one block of Nevada, but the government owns 85% of that land okay so you know i mean th this is not for public use this is this is for their own use okay okay so okay so that's that's all very clear so one one thing i might want to ask then is then since in your classes you notice that uh students tend to typically have more of a pro-government bias instead of a pro-business or private enterprise bias it might be explained by the, partially by the fact that, that they, you know, with the the benefits they enjoy with, uh, you know, uh, student student loans uh, that can be deferred forever, uh, welfare the welfare state, uh, food stamps, whatever benefits they they might have, be predisposed to think about positively in the in terms of what they can receive from the government. But you know the the cell phones that they're using are aren't don't come from the U.S. government. They they, they can't well, see the the benefits yeah. of uh, of private enterprise in the market economy, capitalist economy, uh, supply and demand, uh, basically providing all the all the goods and services that they really depend on on a on a daily basis. So I guess my question to you is: Is it possible that <clears throat> is it possible that a lot of these students uh, are predisposed maybe to, with their pro-government bias, they're predisposed to uh, be more open well, to socialism well, because of they, they, they're so pro-government that they don't see, they don't really want to fight for the little guy in the middle, in the middle America. Uh, they're just willing to let government do whatever it has to do under any guise and under any, under any form of, uh, the, the, under the any truth political is that system. The truth is a little bit more complicated than that. And that this is what, this is where teaching is an art as well as a science. Uh, the truth is that the students in LA are biased toward the government and they're not aware of that bias when it comes to things like plan, uh, listening to re rhetoric of politicians of how to sa solve problems. But they're biased against the government in almost every other way. <laughs> and they're not, they're not always aware of that either. So for example, they're biased against the government when it comes to their own phones or their cars or their, their privacy, which they highly value or their, um, their, their personal freedoms that they highly value, like the ability to travel, um, the right to get married, <laughs> uh, the right to have a religion, even if they don't have one, the right to believe what they want to believe, the right to um, have a job, but generally speaking, they, they have such little experience with having a job 
usually it's as an employee only. It, it never it never ceases to amaze me that the students that I have that own their own companies or their parents do almost never have a bias toward Bernie Sanders because they see directly how hard it is to have a, a business, how how hard <clears throat> how difficult it is. The government usually puts barriers to making a living that have almost nothing to do with public interest. I mean, on paper they do, but in reality they don't. It's just some bureaucrat shoving paper around and the net effect is that they have a harder time making a living, whether it's environmental regulations or whether it's um, zoning issues or, uh, you know, human resource issues that they have to deal with. So I, what I do, my job is to clarify the biases that they have and to suggest that they start thinking carefully about, in other words, cutting through the rhetorical BS that is so easy for them to just get enveloped in and wrapped, wrap themselves up in. Well, okay, and so stage one, stage one thinking. Okay, so that being the case, <clears throat> yeah. Before we wrap up our discussion of, on, on, I'd, I'd like to also get back to why. What about those four tenets of widespread economic success? We got to get to that. What he calls okay. the true progressive movement. Okay, so let's do that in route to this. Um, he titled this piece the socialist threat so you know we yeah. we're we're uh, we're not just talking about socialism just for the just for the hell of it just to define terms we in in defining terms we we get to the point where we kind of oh, think, yeah. have to take seriously we have to take seriously uh what he's saying here um so <laughs> One of the unspoken, I, there's, well, there's one thing I wanted to challenge here. One of the unspoken premises, or one one of the things he states here that kind of um, kind of is important for is important for his whole argument from the first days I stated now is that he claims that uh, Bernie Sanders really is the standard bearer for the D Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. That regardless of what happened in 2016 and 2020, remember he ran again in 2020 and lost again. Um, by the I skin of his remember. teeth, but uh, he was um, neck and neck with Hillary in 2016. His claim is that you know because because uh, the DNC saw that even though B Bernie was probably going to eventually be the nominee, they couldn't let that happen because although his his base is mostly his base is mostly. Um, supportive of the Sanders revolution and, and is socialistic in, in his tendencies that Bernie could never win in a general election and therefore uh, the DNC kind of nixed that idea and uh, engineered yeah, I think, uh, Hillary's, I think he, Hillary's win. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with that, but I think he left something out. I think Roan left something out on that one. I think he left out the issue of religion. I think that um, Roan underestimated or misunderestimated, as George Bush would say, the, <laughs> the woke religion, which <clears throat> true, means true. there had to be a woman. It had to be a woman. And the, the idea was that if you could get a woman, that's the next step of this progressive history with a capital H, the march toward progress. And so that came together as well. That's, that was a crucial issue. If Hillary had been a man, well, let me put it this way. If everybody had known that Hillary is a man, then Bernie would have walked right into that. He he would have walked. He would have been the nominee. Because you have two men. 
but but if uh you know if it or if 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 bernie would have said i'm a woman even better <laughs> although i think that that's the later stage because that would be a transgender issue at that point and of course you have to have a, there's a certain order of this right it, it goes by the you know the the development in in civil rights history where black men were able to vote before white women and so then you have barack obama and then you know and yeah, then it's white women and then so you got you know, hillary and then now you got transgender and then there's going to be something after that gay or whatever i guess gay comes first and um, we won't be able to say that america is a Muslim, progressive democratic society until all of that happens atheist mm -hmm. yeah right you right. gotta have an atheist and if you have an atheist muslim against a transgender then you're going to really have an issue with who gets to go first on that one <laughs> but okay, yeah, so that's he a left religion up, right yeah because it has nothing yeah. to do with the fact and according to them religion has nothing to do with facts so but I, that's not my definition of religion well it's interesting that you as you said he he did leave that out it's funny that um yeah he in the first essay mostly peaceful he goes back and when he starts talking about sanders and uh how things have basically how events starting from last year uh were uh opened a can of worms and allowed all of this yeah. to eventually happen he doesn't really talk and mm -hmm. he talks about the the riots and and uh and the language that was uh hence the title of the first article most the, the according to the left and the media those all of those rights were mostly peaceful they weren't harmful they didn't really impact the social order it was just people venting and people uh you know dealing with the injustices of uh right. racism and so let them be you know they're harmless they can destroy billions and billions of property and lives can be lost and uh, we shouldn't really question that but um well that's the bias toward the government <laughs> that's, that's the bias biased. toward the government that's the bias toward the government because uh you saw how they reacted with the capital thing right that yep. was the shrine that was the religious shrine that had been attacked see i mean private property being attacked yawn yeah oh business was attacked that's nothing compared to the capital the capital right, right. building i mean i had a democratic friend on my facebook page describe it in religious language that was the i forget what it was i think he said the temple or the cathedral or something like that but it was it was religious language used of the capital he just couldn't he was so offended Oh, by the way, there was a church that was burned last year. Remember that in D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't care. No, they no. didn't care because that's not their religion. Remember, they attacked Trump for walking across the street and holding a Bible up. They just could not stand that. They couldn't stand that. But attack on the cat. And by the way, I, I say attack. I mean a, a mob of people trying to get in. I don't mean anything more than that. True. Um, a capital, the cap, that's the capital. And look at how, look at how they treated that. They, they made it into a fortress. Right. You know, it's yeah. easier to get into Arlington National Cemetery now <laughs> than it is to get into the Capitol building. You know, they probably don't even have a list anymore. You know how you had, if you wanted to go see the president and you wanted to, take a tour of, uh, of, ca of Congress, uh, you had to get on a yeah. wait list and wait, you know, sometimes six right. months, four, six, four to six months. They probably don't even have a wait list, you know. It's probably easier to get on a wait list to get your vaccine, uh, even though the, yeah. the wait list don't really exist. But there's probably not even a wait to get in, you know. Think about coming in 2022 or 2023. So, uh, yeah, complete double standard. Uh, Triple standard quadruple standard so so but what you said regarding the you know the hagiography of the right you know capital the capital rotunda and the and the white house uh this uh 
this worship of our, the symbols of our democracy. It's just right. a temporary language game. It's a temporary means to an end to that. Well, it's, it's language they wouldn't use when Trump was in office. Let me say it that way. No, yeah, but now, now that, not. now that they've got their man in, in, in power and they, uh, they can distance the populace Emphasis from, on man. yes. Uh, well, man and woman. Uh, they can distance. They can use this uh, this language and these uh, tactics to basically distance, uh, quell any any questions or any um, any uh, opposition to to what they're doing. But it's a temporary. Uh, it's a temporary. Uh, uh, I would say it's a temporary. Uh, seriousness about democracy so yeah i don't even know if it's serious so let me let me ask you this question but that's me you know uh in the beginning of this article and the previous articles <clears throat> you to me you can't really understand what's going on in this article until you've read the other the previous pieces because uh roan is talking about all the things that have happened to our democracy uh, the consolidation of power in the hands of a few, the consolidation of power in the administrative state, and how yeah. the judiciary and the executive and the um, and the legislative branch, all those powers that are supposed to be delegated only to our estab the established uh, branches of government, have been instead relegated to uh, a fourth branch of government, the administrative state. So that being the case, uh, when you throw in a socialist revolution, which is basically what Sanders is aiming to do. So it, there are several pieces that when they all come together, really sort of mitigate uh, the democratic process. We could be engaging in the democratic oh, yeah, process course. by by going to vote, by showing up, and uh, of course, and, 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 and thinking that they're we're not interested thinking... in democracy. Not really. I mean, but I mean, look at look at uh, look at the the marriage debate, the defining a marriage issue in California in two thousand eight. It was democratically defined as a man and a woman. They threw a hissy fit. It's not really about democracy for them. It's about elite rule. That's what it's always been about. Right, right. Rule by experts. Okay, so let's 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 uh, look at the end of this article. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted you to th that you mentioned is that we have a story in contrast here. We have a story of this uh, burgeoning uh, socialism or social democracy or democratic socialism movement, which opposes yes. everything that we believe in. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, but we also have our current reality or what it has been our current reality, and that's the success of Western democracies, the success, success of Western civilization. So Roan uh, points well, out... That, four, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go, okay. Go, sorry. I, yeah, I was just going to move back into where he talks about the four basic tenets of the, the economic success of the world's uh, most prosperous nations. And he, he points out four, uh, four basic um, tenets or four, I should say, uh, necessary conditions for the su success of Western civilization. Number one is capitalism or market economies. Number two, is a representative form of government. Number three, the utiliz utilization of fossil fuel-based energy. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, number four is the op open trade agreements with other nations. Yeah. Basically, free trade, that can be debated as well. But he argues that these are necessary and sufficient conditions for success of the Western model. Yeah, and this is not a logical point. This is 
this is a historical point. He's saying inductively you can discern this from just looking at um, what in fact happened over the 20th century, eight, uh, the 19th and 20th centuries. True. I mean, I think that's what he would say. Put it that way. Well, then his argument in favor of socialism is that we've, we may... Well, he wouldn't argue in favor of it. No. I'm just saying that the an argument in favor of a proponent of socialism yeah. would say that we've got to chip away at some of these foundations of Western society. By chipping away at capitalism, we, right. we improve fairness, we improve... You might lose choice and uh, mm -hmm. the market forces of supply and demand, the invisible hand. Mm -hmm. But the end result is a benefit for society because there's more, I guess you could say there's more uh, equality and less liberty. Um, but in so doing, you also lose your uh, forms of uh, representative government. Well, uh, of course, the here's, a, here's an issue that we need to use. talk about. Sure. Do you think that do you think that the person that is for abolishing fossil fuels for energy? By the way, I'm just going to plug Dan Crenshaw's latest. No, it's not his latest, but it's a recent podcast where he says, "It." I think the podcast is called "What Happened in Texas." That is a great overview of energy in the United States. Hmm. And he's got two experts that it, that come on, and I learned a lot. I mean, I didn't know some of that stuff, wow. but he explains Texas's system for producing electricity and how that contrasts a little yeah. bit with the United States. But, but uh, you know, the rest of the United States. But he uh, he talks about fossil fuels and the crucial role they play, right. and yeah. um, so I would I plug plug Dan Crenshaw for that. And, you know, he's a Houston-based representative, U.S. representative. So he's in touch with that industry quite a bit. Um, but it's interesting with the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal plugs itself as... Um, moving away from fossil fuels because of a socialistic agenda, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's I mean, not that, really that, seen in capitalistic terms. Yeah. Now, interestingly, the Soviet Union is not a good example of this, neither is China. Actually, no socialist country in the 1900s is a good example of this because, as far as I know, none of them none of them moved away from fossil fuels. Um, I think all of them have seen the benefit of nuclear technology for producing electricity. And that's something that Crenshaw is highly supportive of. Um, The, the attack on nuclear is a part of the Green New Deal. Ironically, though, nuclear is not fossil fuel based, but it's the cleanest uh, of all the options that we have. It's just that we don't, the, the rhetoric, the popular level rhetoric of nuclear energy is, um, is based in kind of fear of storing the the waste you know so people will say you know every time there's a proposal to expand nuclear power uh where are you gonna store it <laughs> you know where you so someone will say are you gonna suggest storing it in your state you know the 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 nuclear waste right and right. and i don't know a lot about storage of nuclear waste but i know it's a hot political issue but I think the politics around it is not based in fact, it's based in fear. And according to Crenshaw, it's what we're talking about as a football field of underground facility for storing 
rods that are radioactive. So, mm -hmm. but now here's my interest, interesting thing about that podcast episode is I immediately knew exact, probably where he's getting his, his feeling. He's a Navy veteran like I am. And I served on platforms that were powered by nuclear technology where the electricity came from a nuclear power plant, like feet from where <laughs> I was, like mere feet from where I was. So I experienced the safety of nuclear technology firsthand. And, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, it, we had to wear, when I was deployed, we had to wear these um, sensors on, a, on us that tracked our exposure. And there is a risk, right? There's always a risk. But um, our, our Navy is nuclear powered. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't have diesel. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't send diesel powered submarines out like we did in world war ii exactly we just don't do that some of the navies that we were paying attention to at the time i was deploying were putting diesel power you know ships out there but we don't do that we have nuclear power ships and the and the well that's just been the trend also apart from its efficiency and safety it's been the trend in certain European societies for decades. Look at France, yeah. and I'm not sure what other well, uh, European countries have a, a lot of uh, yeah. nuclear-based energy, but there are yeah. several. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there hasn't been a Chernobyl yet, or you know. And then what happened in Japan a few years ago? Yeah, those are the things that kind of increase uh, population's fear about the use of nuclear power. And, mm -hmm. um, so even if it were proven to be the most effective <clears throat> and safe means of getting off of coal and other carbon-based mm -hmm. uh, sources of power, we probably would the, a socialist revolution wouldn't even allow for it because you would have you're losing yeah. all the mechanisms of efficiency in the first place that 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 the very use of nuclear power is intended to solve. Now I would I would mention something here. This is by way of critique. Of Roan. Because what I've I've noticed that he's missing in his essay is the issue of wokeness. He missed it with the the Bernie issue of not becoming the the can't the Democratic candidate, right? But he also mentioned it. He missed it here mm -hmm. because in the 1900s, the communist countries would all have used nuclear technology for for a strategy of getting away from fossil fuels. Just turns out that Russia has a lot of fossil fuels, but but uh, places like, um, you know, North Korea and um, China, China and Cuba, you know, these places, they, they have no problem using nuclear technology. Um, now, that, that's because then, and this is, it takes a little bit to get, you know, untangled, but, but the woke issue that we have now is, is a departure from the old communist issue of uh, you know where they use new they would use fossil fuels they would use nuclear technology so the woke thing adds another layer to this that's mm -hmm. a little bit more complicated to, to unravel where they have just an aversion to nuclear technology which would be that would be something that communists probably they don't have any problem with that so i just want to add that and i would also point out that that the nuclear I, I, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I think that the nuclear issue here is government-run. It's it's sure. 
it, there is a bias toward the government in nuclear technology. Um, whether it's the, the laboratories that are developing it, like the Berkeley lab, which was crucial in the 50s or the 40s and 50s, or the, um, the, the, um, the use of nuclear technology in our military, for example. So I would, I would just say that it gets a little bit more complicated mm -hmm. here, but okay. But it, it's interesting. Well, it's, you know, he, he doesn't mention that and he should, um, as I was saying before, he, uh, he doesn't really deal with critical race theory, BLM, social justice issues. And if we look back to the first essay, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's good to bring that back in because sure. at the beginning of this essay, he says, basically the first of the two options about how we're going to perceive what's going to happen in the next few years. The first mm -hmm. was that we're going to have sort of this, um, we'll fall into this. Um, oh, what's his, what's his word here? This form of a comfort zone where people just, just are just, um, uh, just enjoying all the benefits of Western society with technology and their iPhones and iPads and, and uh, Netflix and Amazon delivery <laughs> and so forth. And uh, yeah. just involved in social media and stuck in this nether world of, of uh, unreal life. Um, so when in the first issue, remember, he talked a lot about Brave New World in 1984. And that was yeah. basically uh, the gist of what he was saying about Brave New World is that um, by people just being sucked into this world of uh, by using of using drugs and social media and so forth, uh, there in in, in in Brave New World it was a, a drug called Soma, which is a real drug that we have today and that does basically some of the same things. But whenever people were, you know, wondering about social engineering, can I get a how, prescription of it? Can I get a yeah. prescription of that? You'll need a doctor to write that. Oh. You wouldn't want it anyway. It doesn't do what uh, Aldous Exley says it would do. Oh, okay. Uh, but in that scenario, <clears throat> when you were kind of wondering, am I really free or not? Or am I word of the state? Do I have free choice? No, I'm just a, I'm just a, uh, I'm just a, uh, an automaton. I just do what the state tells me to do. Whenever you're starting to feel like you're a little, like things weren't right, you'd take some soma and you'd, you would, um, you would right. feel better. You wouldn't question the authority anymore. Um, well, in today's society, the, the correlation would be of soma and all the Huxley's brave new world. The correlation would be social media addiction, uh, pornography, yeah. uh, drugs. Uh, but basically, uh, I guess, tech addiction, and it distracts people from their real lives and what their real responsibilities and roles are. Uh, so that's that's yeah. that's that's the first part of that, and, it, and that's what he says here in this essay is that he's kind of bringing that back in and saying, well, if a Demi if you're the if you're a Democrat voter, basically, you know, you can you can half believe that there's no real threat from a Sanders revolution that that the Democrat Party is really just we're just trying to react to all the negative things that happened under, under a Trump administration. We're trying to we're trying to write the write the shit. We're trying to bring it back on course, you know, and we'll get back to eventually we need to overreact a little bit here. Now we need to bring the ship back on course uh, of, of social democracy and and de democratic. Uh, republicanism and just get back to democracy and we'll do that don't question us for now just just uh, accept that we're doing the right thing but the second part of his argument in in the first essay was that uh, <clears throat> for the state to continue to <clears throat> wield power and to take away individual citizens citizens rights and to make impossible popular sovereignty that the state has to step in and use force and that's the that's the that's the allegory of 1984 and uh, i think what he's done in his second and third essays is say that sort of this orwellian 
overuse of power and force and in, 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 in re redefining the Constitution itself has been a an attempt at the use of force uh, along with the, and he talks about in that second essay under consolidation, the fact that the administrative state, what has come to be known in the last four, year, four years as the deep state, has been and can still be sort of a tool to use Orwellian brute force to, as a means to an end. And he comes in, when, yeah. when we, if, we, if we circle back, in the uh, in the way Jen was talking about, uh, to the last article, and we take seriously the socialist threat, then uh, Roan is seems to be saying here that, um, you know, when it comes to and he doesn't mention critical race theory or BLM or social justice issues. But he uh, BLM, to be, let's define that term. It's a Bureau of Land Management, right? Bureau of Land Management, yes. Um, under the Department of the Interior. Uh, but Rowan seems to be saying that you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. That uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> see increased use of. Uh, of non-executive, non-legislative, non-judiciary power. Well, the administrative state is in the executive branch, typically. So it would be, it'd be an executive branch. It would, that's that's it would be an executive branch agency that is legislating and adjudicating. That's the problem. Well, I think, yeah, that's part of what he says that, is the that's, problem there is that they're, 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 these are unelected representatives, these unelect, unelected individuals right. who hold lifetime posts. Right. Yes. And we, and we really have no say about what rules they make about because rules yeah. become laws. And Now, why are they, why do they have lifetime posts? That I don't know. It's a good question. <clears throat> Did those organizations just stipulate that that's the case? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's in the legislation that created them. Ah, uh, with the uh, yeah, yeah. The Congress the made it. The Congress made it that way, and the Congress could unmake it. Now, the reason Congress doesn't do that is because they're afraid. They're afraid of being not being reelected because they would lose, lose support. So, <clears throat> okay, my, my battery is about to go dead. All right. I can't believe I've lost this much battery. Must be part of the administrative state, must be part of the deep state. But I, let me point out something sure, here. Sure. Let me let me really quickly um, before I die. There are millions of us who serve. This is I'm on the last page. You may find reductionist approaches claiming the Cold War was nothing more than a harmless difference of opinion on economic models. Do not be fooled. Mm. There are millions of us who serve as primary historical sources having been on the ground and seen with our own eyes the overland barrier across Europe during the Cold War. This barrier was multi-layered and had overlapping and interconnected deadly measures all pointed inward toward their own people. The, uh, I promised the author of this I would not discuss the real person behind this article but I can I can verify that the person that that wrote this knew firsthand what he was talking about and described to me machine guns that were at knee level that would pop out of the ground on on the on the triggering of a sensor 
toward people trying to escape the Iron Curtain that this person saw firsthand. Yep, and probably still exists along the uh, um, DMZ in North Korea, South Korea border too. Oh. I'm sure. Yeah. Or people trying to leave Cuba. Well, you, well, you're a primary source. I'm a primary source. We both served in the Cold War. I lived in Vietnam for four years. I traveled to Russia in 1992 after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. But I yeah. traveled to China, Hong Kong, Laos, Vietnam, all during that time. Yeah. And so... Uh, the language game that Bernie Sanders is playing is that this is just socialism. Don't take it too seriously. It's yeah. not communism. Well, the the name of the, the official name of the government of Vietnam is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. It's not the com. It's not the Communist Party. The yeah. Communist Party. Yeah, but it's a, yeah. You know, they the, like to use the word democratic too, like the DPRK. Yeah. DPRK. I remember in the Navy, I was like, what's DPRK? We'd see DPRK on the board. I can't, I probably shouldn't mm -hmm. say more about that, but but DPRK is Democratic People's Republic of of Korea. Korea, yeah, the North, North Korea. North so Korea. no communist country states it's communist in, in its name or official By design. paperwork or documentation. It's a, again the shell game. It's saying I have five percent battery, so just FYI. Very good, I might very be good. Popping up. We'll just we'll just fade away when it's time. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, you know what? Um, let me let me go ahead and save it and finish it. We'll just sure. we'll stop right there, and we'll bid you adieu because I don't want to lose this. Okay. Sounds good. Okay.